Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'll start. Um, so the title of my presentation is The Cruel Roots of Singaporean Sand, The Impact of Sand Dredging in Southeast Asia. So Singapore's land reclamation projects have um, is directly linked to the various infrastructure projects. And infrastructure projects show how Singapore is built on the extraction of land and labor from regional neighbors. So this presentation was inspired by a documentary called Lost World by Kalyani Imam. So this is a still of um, the documentary and it shows there is this is a picture of a Cambodian fisherwoman perched on a fishing boat looking down at the river with mangroves in the background in the Koh Kong province in Cambodia. Also this film is online if anyone wants to watch it. And these are also stills from the documentary. On the top right, we have the Cambodian woman now standing in front of a construction site in Singapore with large hills of sand in the background. And large lorries of uh, large lorries are leaving the site. And on the bottom left hand corner, there is a large ship with crane equipment digging sand on the coastal shores of a river in the Koh Kong province in Cambodia. The shores are densely covered with mangrove trees. Now, since 2007, Singapore has imported over 80 million tons of sand from Cambodia. The documentary follows the journey of a fisherwoman from the coastal Koh Kong regions of Cambodia to Singapore. In the documentary, she says, and that's this quote at the bottom of the slide, for me and most fisher folk, our identity on this coastal region is dependent upon sand. The ocean needs sand. The mangrove with its roots also need land. These identities are interconnected and support one another to be fulfilled. Now this, and then she then shares a local folk song that celebrates the mangrove forest. So this specific part made me think about what connection do Singaporeans feel to their physical land? What is the Singaporean identity or relationship to the land? This land that is made of sand that is actually from all over the region that Singaporean corporations take knowing that this will cause complete destruction of ecosystems and the displacement of whole communities. Now the songs also, as well that are taught in Singaporean primary schools and secondary schools to children never draw attention to the land. They draw attention to the country, to the people, to the state, but never to the land. And I think this is because our connection to the land has been the internalizing of a colonial mindset where the Singaporean idea of their relationship with the land is that it is something that needs to be cleared in order for it to be improved, for in order for growth, in order for progress to take place. Now, this is because the modern city state of Singapore has this status as an anomalous colonial settler state in the Nusantara, the Malay world, as Lili Zubaida Rahim writes. Now, in the state's construction of Singaporean identity, indigeneity is discouraged because the majority of the population are ethnic Chinese and they make up about 79% of the population. And this population makeup was due to colonial policies. Now, I will share some quotes um, that I hope will make this clearer. The first quote is from Kalyani Ma'am with relation to her documentary, Lost World, where she asks, what kind of world can be built from sterile and lifeless sand and land that has no roots, no history and no memory? except for the violent extraction from its homeland. And now the second quote from Lili Zubaida Rahim's book, Singapore in a Malay World. Um, and this quote is in relation to how Sing what Singaporean state discourse looks like. The, Sing the Sing state's economic achievements have contributed to an attitude of regional exceptionalism, triumphalism and ambivalent regional identification. Thompson's 2003 to 2005 survey of National University of Singapore student perceptions found that Singapore was seen as being a part of rather than a part of Southeast Asia. This active ambivalence has no doubt been encouraged further by the preeminence of economic developmentalism as a raison d'etre of the nation state of Singapore. This active ambivalence has led to Singaporeans looking more strongly to the West rather than East in imagining a future direction for the country. While Singapore is described as small, clean, rich, multiracial and developed, the Southeast Asian region is described as poor, underdeveloped, developing, backward, Muslim and big. Now, going back to land reclamation in Singapore, 
So land reclamation has been a practice that started in Singapore in 1822 under the British rule. So since the country's independence in 1965, its land area has expanded by a whopping 22%. And there are plans to add a further 5,600 hectares by 2030. In 2019, the Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Leung, characterized land reclamation as a defense mechanism against rising sea levels and water insecurity in the island. Now, what is not mentioned in national discourse at all is the fact that the land that Singapore has relied on is derived from its neighbors, Malaysia, Cambodia, Philippines, Vietnam. This ex extraction has meant that coastal communities are immediately affected and displaced in the present. And climate change will affect their lives more acutely. More current direct impacts, such as widespread droughts, the contamination of drinking water, the spread of infectious diseases, and the loss of habitat and species has caused a lot of people to become a large group of vulnerable economic migrants. So as according to Kalyani Mam, at least one member of each family that used to reside by the Cambodian mangrove forest in the Koh Kong province has had to migrate to seek jobs to survive. Now, however, within Singapore, in public campaigns, there is this likelihood to invoke the image of an imminent threat to justify the actions of the state and the different corporations. Now, as you can see in the next slide, now the picture on the left is an advertisement from PUB, the National Water Agency Singapore Instagram account. So it's a picture of a thunderstorm with rising sea levels almost engulfing the Merlion statue located in the central Marina Bay business district. And this ad, you can find it on local train station doors and Instagram, and it, it invokes the sense of like something is coming for all of us. You know? But on the right, there's this picture that was taken from an online petition and campaign from Rainforest Rescue titled, Singapore is dredging our home away, hands off our sand. The campaign was successful. In fact, in 2017, Cam Cambodia banned sand dredging from Singapore. However, Singapore quickly switched sources to Vietnam, Myanmar, and Malaysia. And in 2020 now, coastal communities by the Salween River in Myanmar are facing the same issue as the Cambodians were because of Singapore sand dredging. Now, what is um, now, what I hope my presentation so far has shown is Singapore's strong internalization of the colonial logics and mindset upon which it claims to be founded upon to build its own version of exceptionalism. It does this by distancing itself completely from the lived realities of regional communities in national and international discourse. This is the reason that Singapore positions itself as deserving of the benefits of these extractions. So then now when you really think about it, this exceptionalism really means then supremacy. Singapore celebrates its colonial history as a humble fishing village that was transformed into a bustling developed port due to colonial policies and post-colonial policies that mirrored these colonial policies. This positions Singapore as this exceptional case study of successful colonialism or development. Now this version of national history is being constantly fed to Singaporeans with other historical nar narratives that allow for regional solidarity to develop being erased so vehemently by the state. That the sand which is used to expand the country is this sterile and lifeless with no roots and no history. Because the version of history that is being promoted is the point of view of the businessman, the developer, the entrepreneur, who is after economic progress and growth alone, this again justifies the close relationship between the state and the corporations to be entrenched, only further allowing Singapore to continue these extractions. Moreover, the state constantly forges a siege mentality by invoking an external threat in order to justify its actions as necessary and vital for the country's survival, as you can see from the PUB advertisement. So racial capitalism, by now, racial capitalism, I think, highlights how bodies have to be racialized in order for the capitalist world economy and the modes of extraction to operate. So I'm following, I, I would like to apply Carmen Gonzalez's um, view of racial capitalism, where she calls for a race conscious analysis on climate change and the capitalist world economy. 
The racial capitalism helps us understand how when we say the poor and the global south will be the most affected, we mean the racialized peoples and the indigenous peoples. This is a useful tool in interrogating Singapore's version of exceptionalism, which is informed by colonial racial supremacy. This idea that some are more deserving of progress and some are more suited for progress than others. Now, in fact, according to statistics from the 2019 UN Edgar Missions Report, despite only having a population of 6 million, Singapore has 9.1 tons of CO2 emission per capita. As compared to Cambodia with a population of 16 million, with a one ton CO2 emission per capita. Now, as Gonzalez writes, racism and capitalism are inextricably intertwined. And indigeneity in Singapore is discouraged because the state constantly highlights how the majority of the population are not indigenous to Southeast Asia. Hence, the mainstream relationship with land is that of the relationship between a settler colony and the land that it is something to conquer and that it is something to develop. Now, this needs to be interrogated in order to understand how richer countries such as Singapore do profit at the expense of poorer countries in the region. The fact is that when non-Western countries align themselves or strive to align themselves so closely with the Western capitalist model, they benefit from the racial subordination of those from lesser developed countries. Now, I hope the table on the next slide helps show this in the Singaporean context. So Singapore's rapid infrastructure development and projects require the sand that is imported from Cambodia, Myanmar, Southeast Asia. And this leads to the destruction of mangrove and coastal ecosystems, which then leads to displacements of large communities of people and loss of livelihoods, who then become economic migrants to work in Singapore's rapid infrastructure development projects. In Singapore today, there are about 250,000 female foreign domestic workers, and a majority of them come from Indonesia, Myanmar, and the Philippines. They work on employment visas called work permits that essentially tie them to their employer and limit many of their basic human rights, such as the right to the right of mobility. They cannot leave the country without the permission of the employer and, and things like that. So, in conclusion, Singapore's sand dredging projects in Southeast Asia needs to have a racial lens as well. Singapore's relationship with its colonial history shapes the relationship it shares with its land and regional neighbors. Now, Singapore's version of exceptionalism, which is informed by colonial supremacy, needs to be interrogated in order to allow for better links of regional solidarity to form in combating the climate crisis in Southeast Asia. So I'll just end with this uh, last still of the same woman who goes to Singapore and who's looking ahead at the large hills of sand in the Singaporean sand mine construction site. And she's saying they've shipped over all our land. So uh, yes, that's, uh, that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Bava. Thank you for mm -hmm. sticking to the time limit. Um, just a reminder to those who've come on that um, Rene has said that, in fact, we can turn our screens on. So if you are so inclined, please do so. Just please keep muted. Um, that'll enhance the recording. Also, the same format as yesterday. In other words, we keep the questions and comments until the um, end of the session, but you can make your um, you can pose your questions or make your comments either in chat or by sticking your hand up at the at the end of the session. Okay, so um, we now move on to the second um, presenter, Marco Lagman of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and he's speaking on typhoons and their impact on infrastructure projects in six localities of northern Albe, a preliminary study. Over to you, Marco. Uh, hi, uh, good morning, good evening. So um, I hope you can now see my screen. Yeah, we can yes. see it. Okay, thank you very much. So as you can see, the title of my paper is The Impact of Typhoons, Rainfall and La Nina on Infrastructure Project Programming and Prioritization in Six Localities of Northern Albay. And it's a preliminary study. Um, the picture that's and back, uh, along the background of the title is actually a picture of a uh, 
a river control project that was destroyed by the most recent typhoon, Typhoon Raleigh, last November 1st, 2020. I was there. It was a very powerful storm. The typhoon stayed for six hours in Tabaco, where I'm staying. And as you can see at the back of the destroyed river, system, uh, river control system are actually houses that the said infrastructure is trying to protect. It's in Tiwi Albay, one of the towns. Next slide. Okay, so well, clearly some countries and places are more hazard prone than others. And in the case of the Philippines and the province of Albay, uh, we have it harder. Um, due to what we call the tyranny of geography, ge geological and meteorological hazards are quite common in the Philippines. In fact, there are studies that indicate that the country suffered the most natural quote-unquote disasters during the last century and at present ranks third in the world when it comes to being at risk to hazard events. Um, well, like, like all of us know this, that climate change that's upon us will make extreme weather events even more intense, frequent, and lengthy. And unfortunately for the Philippines, typhoons now make up one third of all disasters globally. And in my country, around 19 to 20 typhoons enter our area of responsibility. And in my home province of Albay in southeastern Son, we get around three to five direct hits every year. So I apologize for my son's school map i assure you the maps will get better as we go along so where is albay albay is in the southeastern tip of luzon the main island one that's encircled and as you can see in the map it has a color blue mark dark blue which is it means it's most vulnerable to climate risk disaster climate risks um, northern albay is though is the portion of the province that faces the pacific ocean unfortunately so it's from, it, it composed of Tiwi, Malinao, Tabaco City, where I'm from, Manilipot, Bakakai, and Santo Domingo. So six of those. Now, this is a better version of the map. Uh, not only do we have to deal with typhoons, we also have to deal with volcanic eruptions. Uh, we have the fortune and misfortune of having actually three volcanoes. The green marks are actually volcanoes. Mount Malinao on top, Mount Masaraga, or the not so good looking sibling of Bayon, which is at the bottom, which is a perfect cone whose territories transcend, transcend those of Tabaco, Malipot, Bakakay, and Santo Domingo. So uh, Mayon erupts every five years, more or less. Uh, the last eruption, I think, was 2009 to 2010. And then there was also an eruption in 2006. So, um, among Albay, Albay is the province in the Philippines that suffers the most damage to typhoons in terms of infrastructure and agricultural losses. But even in that province itself, and I just, just discovered this recently during the course of writing this paper, Northern Albay, where I come from, uh, is the most at risk of suffering from typhoon-induced damage. And it's got features six features that make, make it so. Number one, you know, it receives the most precipitation. Uh, 3,300 milliliters a year would be around 134 inches. So that's a lot of rain. Uh, Manila, Metro Manila, uh, by comparison, receives 100. So it's like almost three feet more of rain per year. Um, it has areas that are more prone to landslides. Uh, since the American period was recorded to have the least forest cover among the sections or districts of Albay, and it has the high, it is the most at risk of being hit by a typhoon. And coastal areas are its coastal areas are most prone to flooding and storm surges. Uh, I'll just advance the slide. Here is a map again, a typhoon risk map and a coastal flooding map. And the darker, the darker it is, the more at risk you are. And unfortunately for Al for Albay, northern Albay. We have it really bad. So, um, well, it's quite obvious extreme environmental processes can hamper an area's growth and development prospects. Albay's infrastructure, has always, which is a major component of development, of, of promoting development, has constantly been compromised by unsafe conditions and, you know, pretty violent, you know, typhoons. 
and rainfall. Uh, research in the Philippines, disaster risk reduction and management has become a very popular field. In fact, it's similar to the 1980s poverty studies where a lot of consultants make money out of it. But unfortunately, if you look at the literature, there's very, there are very few studies that seek to analyze how local and national governments have been investing in infrastructure to protect people from water, from water-based uh, hazards like typhoons, floods, and mudslides. Very few, actually quite scant. Uh, in fact, um, when I talked with the districts, the Albay District's engineering office, they said that they haven't made such a study. They were glad that I'm attempting to come up with one and they'd like to know the results, right? To see the percentages of the shares of the different types of infrastructure projects that they have come up with in the past 20 years. So this preliminary study basically intends to describe and examine three types of projects, river control, which includes desilting and rechanneling, drainage facilities, and the construction and the construction of seawalls. So uh, I went a few months ago to the Albay district office and they were gracious enough, even during the time of the pandemic to uh, share with me their data, but it was pretty raw. So I had to make sense of it. It actually took me a month to come up with a database for these 2,600 infrastructure projects. But at the end of the day, I was able to see the data and see that it's usable for three types of things. Number one, what would be the percentage of public works activities in terms of quantity and cost that were allotted for these types of projects, river control, drainage, and seawalls. The same time, um, using GIS or geographic information systems, I got assistance from a former student, a good friend of mine. Um, how were these projects distributed over time? Were there changes? over the years. Uh, and last but not the least, um, did the sequencing of these projects coincide with the aftermath of typhoons, annual, very extreme annual pre precipitation rates, or even La Nina years? So this is, these are the objectives of the study. So let's start with the results. Uh, when it comes to infrastructure, all in types of infrastructure are developmental. But what I observed with the study is that a good amount of the projects here in my home district and home, hometown was actually based on two types. One was just simply uh, developmental, meaning social services in the form of schools, better roads, bridges, waterworks, clinics, covered courts, multi-purpose pavements. But some were actually focused on what we call and what I would like to call preventive public works, the ones that uh, intends to save lives and property. So when I looked at the Excel files, I realized that of more than a fourth, 26% of these projects, of these public works, were, were involved with the building, maintenance, repair, and expansion of river and flood control facilities, drainage works, and seawalls. But what actually surprised me was the cost. Despite the fact that it was only 26% of the projects, um, its value was 42% of the total infrastructure spent. So over the years, over the past 20 years, 2001 to 2019, around $330 million roughly was spent on this area for infrastructure. 42% or around almost 120 million was spent on basically river control. And I'd like to share this um, insight. The thing with... Uh, voting populations that they would appreciate roads, bridges, covered courts because they're tangible and you can see it. But sometimes these projects, the silting, river control, you can't see those things. And in fact, there was one politician who concentrated on this in the 1990s and almost lost in an election, despite the fact that it saved this city of several floods. So the, here you see that the whole thing is also politicized and it might be unpopular to do this, but it's the most reasonable thing to do because she can't really put a best of value on, on, on lives, right? Or on properties probably, but lives of course can't. Now let's uh, look at the maps. Um, clearly what you will see with respect to river works is that during the early part of the deck uh, of the current century, there weren't many river works. And even as a, even as a 
young uh, young adult, I never really experienced massive floods there at that time. And then all of a sudden, by 2005, they started constructing river works or river control projects in large numbers. It suddenly spiked. And in fact, there are like several areas, as you can see in the map, that were in these projects tended to concentrate. And clearly, uh, Northern Albay is filled with rivers and tributaries, and it's tributaries. It's everywhere. It's like a it's like basically water world, and people really fail to realize it because it's the bridges connect all these places. But in fact, it's basically a lot of set places separated by water. And um, after a very power, a very bad year, and I was farming at that time. I had a vegetable farm. Typhoons Millennium and Remain basically destroyed the economy of this uh, of Northern Albay. And that was the time when river work started to spike. And that was the first time that we really suffered from massive flooding. And these river works are not cheap. When you dredge, when you rechannel rivers, when you put river control, when you put walls on it, they range from around 10 million to 50 million pesos or at the most $200,000. I mean, that may not, may not mean much in a first world country, means a lot in a third world, in a developing country like the Philippines. Here's an example of a river control system that was damaged with the last typhoon. And just to show the scale, look at the humans beside it. Um, here you will see that it was really destroyed, but on the other side, on the left, you can see that there's a hilly area and it's filled with coconuts, a clear, a very, very clear sign of deforestation. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get enough deforestation or forest cover data. But to, prove, to emphasize a point, from 2001 to 2005, there were only seven villages or barangays that had river control projects. By 2006 to 2010, there were 58. And by the end of the study, there were at least 119. So it goes to show that you know, um, the flood-related damage was, beca was becoming a real threat, or floods were became, are becoming an increasing threat over time. Um, OK, so this is the last slide for Riverworks. Um, what is surprising is that almost a, a very large percentage of Riverworks projects was actually concentrated in only seven villages. And it makes you wonder um, how come how much money was spent there. And I talked with one of the engineers. They told me that it's basically like maintenance medicine. If you have hypertension, you just have to keep on dredging and dredging and dredging every so often because of the fact that it's near the Mayon volcano and there are gullies over there. And we don't really know how much, how much ash has been deposited over time. So it's something that they have to do on a regular basis. And that's probably the reason why it's becoming a fixture in the landscape of Northern Albay to have a lot of these projects. Now, when it comes to seawalls, they seem to follow the same pattern of the ebb and flow pattern of these constructions. And seawalls, you can't, the only difference is that they increased only during 20, 2008, and then they seem to be on the upswing again. Um, how important are these seawalls? Seawalls are very much appreciated to the point where in Tobacco City recently, and I, I was surprised that there are a lot of artists in my hometown. A lot of people are now turning these massive seawalls into um, art walls or walls of art. And this is basically recognition of the fact that they use it and they know its use and it's part of the landscape. So it's a good thing. That, that, that is a good thing. What's not very good about it is that it's very expensive. Um, like river works, it costs from 10 to 50, to 50 million pesos. Um, recently, seawalls have become larger and more expensive to the point that it's, it costs you about 50 million pesos. In the past, it would cost you five, the highest would be 30, but recent times it's becoming very expensive and pretty common because if, as you can see, uh, in the coasts of Maliripot and Tabaco, they already form some kind of semi-chain of walls. And the ones, the islands, the, the island villages like uh, the one in San Miguel Island, that the one facing the Pacific, they already have their own walls. And that, that was a bit of a surprise for me. And they told me that in recent times, the 
surges are becoming stronger so that they had to construct uh, seawalls in these places where in the past they didn't have to. Uh, for drainage works, drainage works didn't really follow um, the temporal patterns of seawalls and river works. They were more concentrated uh, during 2008 to 2013. Not much, but what is very clear about these drainage works is that they follow the river. So where the river is, there, there they are. And in terms of location, the villages that were sites of river works projects, these were also the sites of the drainage projects. And in fact, if, if you would observe the maps over time, they tended to move from one place to another, but they are very much interconnected with each other. To the point where I am guessing here, I haven't even confirmed this, that these projects by the national government have become in integrated when it comes to sewerage works or drain systems over time. So that is a good thing. It means that there seems to be a clear plan on what to do. It wasn't uh, a hot, they weren't, it, this wasn't done at the whim. So rarely do you praise government, but at least at this point, you can give them credit for that. Now, um, these are one of the last slides. Is there a pattern with respect to the construction of these uh, flood control and storm surge projects and typhoons, oh, drainage projects? Um, um, hold on. Uh, Uh, sorry about that. Uh, anyways, um, so is there a pattern or some kind of uh, relationship between river control projects, seawall projects, drainage projects, and factors such as typhoons, rainfall, and La Nina years? And apparently, there seems to be a pattern, um, the, especially when you're de dealing with rainfall. Um, the, colored, the colored sections of rainfall or for the rainfall column indicates those years that exceeded 134 inches. And what is clear is that from 2006 to 2013, except for 2010, which was which is quite anomalous, there was really a lot of rainfall in that area, in, my, in Northern Albay, and it coincides with these projects. Um, also the La Nina years as well, from low, medium to severe, again, there seems to be a pattern. I emphasize millennia in Ramin because this is the first time in history that damages surpassed a billion pesos. That's a lot of that's a lot of money. Uh, and then damages became the damages hitting a billion pesos became more common after that. Of course, it should also include inflation, but it doesn't account for everything. So, um, just to uh, end my, my my presentation. Clearly, vulnerability and the Ill, Ill effects of natural events should be appreciated in terms of different scales. The scale of the nation, the scale of the province, or scale of the localities. And Albay in the Philippines, Albay province is one of the worst hit, but a portion of its of, of, its, of the province, Northern Albay has it worst. Um, there's no disputing the fact that Albay district is, district one is susceptible to rainfall and excess water. And it has it had an impact on how its infrastructure funds have been spent over time, which makes you wonder that if 40% of your funds are spent on preventing loss, how much money could have been used for even more developmental work? And that's a sad part. Um, even if we say that it's effective and I can vouch for this, there was a um, river control facility that was dam completely damaged last November, 2020, but the engineers and even the people who were there said that if it weren't for the fact that they were maintaining it and dredging it con continuously over time, a lot of people may have died in that village. So there were no deaths in the during the last typhoon, fortunately, but massive damage in terms of property. Um, Rechanneting, desilting and dredging uh, of rivers and even seawalls seem to have share a pattern geographically over time. Um, and then it's very clear that the existence of these public works are a testament to the sensitivity of both the public and policymakers with respect to the occurrence of typhoons and extreme events. Now, can more work be done? Yes, clearly. 
um, the data that I studied can still be uh, analyzed further and can come up with a more nuanced story because it doesn't even include uh, schools, waterworks, facilities, and roads damaged by typhoons. And I was taught by one official on how to read through the documents because the documents are, in, are written in, are handwritten, but it told me that there are codes that they used to indicate that it was basically storm damage. Um, also, the sequence of repairs, particularly when it comes to riverworks. Um, when was a riverwork project a construction project, an expansion or a rehabilitation project or a maintenance project? We don't know, but this is something that I am keen on finding out. There's also more data needed for reforestation and forest cover. And unfortunately, the Department of the Environment and Natural Resources isn't that cooperative. Uh, I'll be going there tomorrow again. I'll be traveling to the province again. And I'll see if I can get more data. As for triangulation, the data that I provided are, nas are national government budgeted infrastructure works. It does not include infrastructure works that are budgeted by the local governments themselves, since they have the power to do so as well. And perhaps there's, it's time to marry quantitative data that I have, but qualitative data, the informant interviews and expert opinions. And also finally, probably look at not just gray infrastructure, which is basically cement and steel, and consider how can green infrastructure help in alleviating floods and inundations and storm surges in the area. And that's about it. Marayin salamat po. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. And so we move on to our third and last speaker for this session, uh, Gamal Mohammed from Murdoch University, Australia, who's going to speak on the making of an economic scape in Mount Merapi, Java, in the from the 19th century to around 1940. Over to you, Gamal. All right. Um... Um, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, um, yes, yeah, so um, the, um, the title of my, um, uh, my research, my, my paper is um, The Making of an Economic Scape in Mount Merapi, Java from 19th century to 19, 1940. It is part of my um, ongoing PhD thesis um, um, supervised by Jim Warren. So, um, so what is um, what, what's um, one of the most interesting questions in um, in my mind about um, about about this research in, in Mount Merapi as part of the pilot project to see a bigger um, bigger problems in 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 the in, in, in the archipelago is why people um, um, uh, why people uh, choose to uh, stay in 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 very dangerous uh, place to live like Mount Merapi. Why? It's very dangerous because um, it erupts um, quite um, 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 the, the, in, the, the intensification, uh, the, the, the eruptions itself um, erupt quite um, um, in, in many times in, 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 in the past um, 100, 200 years. And even um, some research, um, some researchers said that, well, um, it could go on to um, uh, the the phase of the eruptions could, could go up to four years and possibly possibly could could um, uh, one bigger eruptions in each uh, in 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 each um, in each about in each seventy years. So um, why 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 people still live there? I mean, so close to the volcano. So um, and then I come to the um, to 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 a um, to an exhibition in 2019 after a a um, an a, a a a workshop in Yogyakarta uh, with. Uh, um, with, with my supervisor as well, um, but uh, I, I went separately in Jakarta. And then I saw this picture and I saw how, um, um, I have to explain it because it's really interesting and I hope I can share this interest with you. Um, how um, um, you can see the, uh, the blue, um, blue brush and also the, the red brush um, at the surface of Mount Merapi and Mount Merapi itself is projected as black. So, um, um, so I see blue itself as 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 as, as a the, the life giving force of Mount Merapi, which I later found um, during an interview um, with a um, an, a, a, a a retired priest um, in Muntilan in in in, in west um, side of Merapi, and how he referred Merapi as water mountain, not a fire mountain, not a volcano. So uh, we'll going on now. Uh, okay, so. Um, so um, Merapi itself, well, um, 
Um, it's um, at, at present, it's the height is 2,968 meters above sea level and it's part of special province of Yogyakarta and Central Java. And during colonial periods, which is also um, the, the challenging aspect of my, of my research is, the, uh, uh, is uh, many parts of the area have different name. So um, I have to go back and trace, and even from the uh, from the Afdeling, from the um, from, from 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 the name of the uh, um, from from the from, from the um, from the regency itself, go up to the villages level. So I have to search through and then to mix match. Um, I have to match through the the, the present data and the, the past data to see um, the differences. But my my focus today of, of my presentation today is um, my paper on the. Uh, and on, on, on the um, on the um, how how Merapi, um, the the economic aspect of Mount Merapi. So in 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 um, at the at well roughly at the present in 1520 kilometers of Mount Merapi, it's habit, inhabited by 200 to 200 to 26,618 people, and it was about equivalent to the um, entire population of Kedu Province in um, 1812, about 197,310 in. 213,933 hectares, which is of course bigger than the west side of Merapi. And then, um, and this aspect of water mountain, and um, this is um, something that I, I, I've been thinking about um, um, earlier and up until recently, and up until now actually, that um, and how people um, inhabit in this area, and why, and and and, and why um, they they stick to the area so much. Well, one of the reason in 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 the physical and in geographical reason is is that the um, the, the water in Merapi is very is abundant. There are about eleven major rivers from uh, that has the upstream in, in at the top of Mount Merapi, um, about eight hundred to one thousand meters, and from the west to. Um, so for the west to south, south from to to to, to southeast of Merapi, and then um, and um, these um, these these what these these rivers has been um, used along with the agriculture the, the, with the process of agriculture in, in 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 the west side especially and and in the south too. But um, in the west side, because of the um, because of the terrain, um, because of the terrain in 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 Kedu side, um, um, more suitable to to agriculture due to the um, uh, to to the to, to to the land itself is not too much uh, steep, so um, um, uh, the the uh, the um, uh, the rice agriculture could go even in the in the early uh, in in the 19th century could go up to uh, in in the higher in the, in the higher in the higher place, and later on in the in the in the in the 20th century it would go up to one uh, 800 to 1,000 meters uh, below uh, um, above sea level in the west side, but not in the south and in the east. So this is um, um, very interesting, and that's uh, what um, makes the south and the east also has different uh, uh, trajectories in history. And uh, an aquifer also is found in each of the major rivers around 800 to um, 1,000 meters. So uh, above 800 to 1,000 meters, you could you could see the uh, on, on the on the on the on the left um, picture here um, that um, it's um, it's it's. It looks dry, but uh, it it depends on because it's up to uh, it's above 1,000 meter. It's, uh, it needs the um, rain to fill in the uh, uh, the catchment, but it has an um, an aquifer itself. And then um, when the fire mountain calls, um, the Kali Lamat could go to and on the left side could uh, be devastated like that, and Lahar and and, and the Kali Blongkeng could go like that and. And then um, the the uh, the the, uh, the entire plant, uh, plantation agriculture could uh, could be wiped out, and especially in the west, um, in the west side. And then in Merapi, we see that um, the um, gas explosions, then effusive, effusive um, eruptions. This is happens most frequently in Mount Merapi, and explosive eruptions as well. And in and it um, the biggest one, one of the biggest um, um, eruptions from Merapi that. Uh, uh, Give explosive eruptions is in 1872, and um, later on in 2010. And so the left side gas explosion and effusive eruptions is the uh, continue um, the um, um, is um, the, the uh, is the most frequent happen in Merapi. And also, of course, uh, Merapi because of the um, of the abundant water that it has, 
um, even Yogyakarta from um, the period of the of the uh, early 20th century already um, took the water um, already used the water from um, from 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 the upland from the from from uh, uh, from from the from from Rapi high above um, sea level and how and 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 how how do they utilize the upland so um, 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 uh, my one of my point of argument is the collaboration of the three parties between the Dutch planters, um, the Dutch colonial government, and Japanese arist aristocrats. So um, I did I did not give um, um, present any 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 um, picture in this in this in this um, in this uh, uh, presentations, but um, uh, perhaps I can give you later if you like. Um, uh, the the Nahus van Burgs, for instance, he was uh, the resident of Yogyakarta from 1860 to 1822 and resident of Surakarta um, at the end of the Java War in 1827-1830. So he was the man who who had a, who who gave a powerful lobby to the um, to the governor general, even to the king of the Netherlands himself. So itself. So um, Nahuis, he had well, he had to fight of, over this um, idea, his idea to utilize the upland and then um, and then open the plantation in, in the south of, of, of Merapi. And he had to fight um, with um, Nah uh, with Van der Kappelen, the Governor General of the of, of Netherlands India from 1816 to 1826, um, to the point where Van der Kappelen at one point uh, he decided no 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 there there will be no more a plantation so. Um, they abolished every plantation, so, and, and then uh, Nahuis went back to the to, to the Netherlands, and then and there he made a lobby to the uh, to, to the king himself. And this and in this part of the of the of the of the period, um, um, one book in, in in particular can um, is uh, one book in particular is the um, the uh, the um, uh, of Vincent Hauben and talks about that um, and it's and. And um, with much robust data as well. And in 1817, uh, Nahuis rented the land of Bedoyo to the Sultan, one of the uh, earliest plantation in 1817. And then he went itself to the himself to and with with two other uh, companies to to Merapi in 1820, and from Solo from the north side. And then um, and then um, when and during the time of uh, crisis after the Yafa War when. Um, when when the king wanted to abolish the um, the, the entire force in London, the the, uh, the kingdoms of the Yogyakarta and Surakarta, it was uh, the Nahuis who uh, who could persuade the king and persuade Van den Bosch to give the land force in London, keep it, but open it for private plantations. So um, from 1822, um, um, in at the slopes of Merapi, there are only about um, several plantations, but in 1873 there are about 20. 20, um, 20 plantations um, um, occupying 45,000, uh, 32,505 hectares of land in the east and southwest, and then um, uh, mostly um, growing coffee and um, in, in indigo and sugar in the, in, in the below um, area. So this is um, some of the pictures of the um, of, of the uh, the. Uh, uh, not civilization, but image of um, what um, of, of the of the uh, of the um, of the society back then that um, that uh, that that could not be seen again because it was already in the, uh, it, it was already during the colonial period and the Indonesian period did not uh, did not continue. Um, and 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 Kedu, I had to also to mention, and is this one of the, um, again? It's one of the most fertile regions in Central Java Plain. But um, because of the mis um, uh, um, mis uh, um, of, the, of the government policy, um, it suffered a lot. Uh, for instance, um, um, uh, rifles gave um, land tax to the to the to the to the people of the area, and then um, much people suffered. And because it um, it was not followed by the um, um, intensive uh, modernizations of the area, so um, and so they were suffered and and malnutrition and. And in, in 1822, the Merapi erupted, and then um, the, the the people went to the uh, to, to the war, and then fought with the Ponogoro against the Dutch. So it's a, it's a quite uh, logic. And then um, so it's um, um, so after 1830, no European or Chinese planter in Kedu, and um, but um, but because it's part of the intense um, um, cultivation project, um, cultivation system of the Dutch, so. Um, 
Um, so um, uh, they, uh, the Dutch made pipelines uh, for cultivation up to 1,000 meters, and then um, it uh, also uh, uh, become the driving force of the of the villages and also the uh, new uh, new farmlands or uh, new, new new agricultural lands at the slopes at the west sides of Merapi. And uh, um, oh, th th this is the um, the um, the the also one project of the of of, of the of the Dutch is to um, by, by the with with the uh, uh, urge of the from from the from the planters of Merapi is to open the uh, open the area um, and and also using um, the um, connected with the with the railways uh, Netherlands in the Spoorweg Maatschappij from Semarang to Forsten London to Surakarta and Yogyakarta. If you can see here um, on, the, on the left side here, it's uh, the uh, the uh, railway itself. Um, it's encircling the mountain Merapi and Merbabu. Um, uh, so. Um, it's much um, discussed actually the eruptions of um, the eruptions of Merapi, but um, um, and even there is um, one um, um, paper um, uh, uh, much quoted already uh, from Feucht. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to draw your attention to um, uh, so um, so these problems of lahar, the uh, the the mud flows um, because of the of of the 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 the, the coming of the uh, water from the from the upstream down below, uh, with uh, the rocks as well as the locks, the clocks, and and every and, and the volcanic materials as well, has become the problem. And from 1822 and 1836, and um, um, and um, but no mitigation policy in terms of cultivation system in the West. And um, and also um, this um, um, uh, eruptions from the period of um, 1850 until 1900. Um, um, I've made a um, the uh, the uh, detailed um, uh, data about this, and it's um, uh, the the problem keeps on happening and happening. But um, but because economy um, ec the economy has to progress, has to go on. So uh, so um, the, uh, the 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 policy of the of, of the government is to make a relief and give um, uh, is to is to is to support um, um, the the the. The, the the place that are, that's been ravaged by the by the hazards and then build it rebuild it again but then um not about the, not think about the uh, the future mitigation process and in 1830 is also the same and um, and the problem of lahar in 1930 1935 to the west and southeast and um and i i um uh, i i i've got already data from various newspaper company report of randu gunting plantations for instance in the southeast from 1931 to 1935, so um, several years after the eruptions, the uh, the problem of uh, of the volcanic um, eruption still persists due to lahar, because of um, um, of, of of the of the um, of the um, 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 rainfalls, the high the heavy rainfalls in in in, in the Merapi area, and and how the the the, the, the volcanic materials were uh, were were placed at the top, and then the rainfalls make the um, make all the waters go belong uh, go downward with the with with the with the with the hard materials. And then Gamble, I you have Gamble, Sorry, you have five minutes left. Yes, thank you, thank you. So um um, um I come to the um, one of the last uh, slides of my presentations. This is the economic opportunity for for, um, for planters in Merapi, for instance, in the Watupang, um, in the in in the in, in the east side of, of, of Merapi, um, and how uh, um, actually um, um, in in the long run they could they, uh, it's uh, the, the the plantations is 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 uh, is, um, is 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 um, is is very profitable. I mean, um, if you can see what happened in in in, in 1930, the, the the coffee plantations went, um, the coffee production went down, and what happened in 1922, the tea plantation went down. But then, um, they could still make something, uh, um, some some progress in terms of the um, economic profit. So, um, so it's um, so um, it's. Um, so um, economic opportunity is there, and if you go, if you see the um, in in the Mupit, also in the east side. Um, uh, this is the tobacco production. Also, uh, in in the 1922, it fell um, a bit, but then goes again. Even in the 1930, this is the the, the highest peak of the of the productions, uh, and then until it go 
down because of us. I think um, one partly is due to the um, to the uh, the uh, the Great Depression in the 1930s. And also uh, the uh, the um, the figures of the um, productions of coffee, tea, nutmeg from Baru Stampir from the east side as well. Um, and um, also, well, uh, arguably, um, uh, they, they 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 were still all right. So it was it was not the eruptions that uh, made them cancel the uh, the productions, but the um, the politic. Uh, uh, the politic upheaval in the 1930-1940, of course, the Second World War. So the, my conclusions in terms of the terrain itself, Mount Merapi is both a water mountain and fire mountain. And this water mountain, uh, how it's in terms of life giving force is quite abundant in the, in, 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 in this, in, 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 in this, in my paper and how um, this is the, the, the reason why people stay there. And, and then um, the ch um, despite the challenging terrain in the South and East, um, there is still economic advantage. I found um, a, uh, an, a saying in Dutch, it's uh, like a dancing of the vulcan. So just like a, a dancing um, under the volcano, <laughs> an active volcano. Uh, the, um, the Netherlands don't have a volcano, but uh, in Indonesia do have volcanoes. So uh, probably it comes from, <laughs> from Java, um, the sayings. So uh, why the plantation prevail? So it was, um, was already, the cultivation already started before 19th century, but it has intensified it. Even um, one of the programs of the, uh, the volcanological survey of the Netherlands, India, um, is to make sure that uh, the economic activity come back after the event of disaster. So how to make the economic, economic, economic activity keep progress and keep going forward. So um, despite the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the problems that persist. Persisting. Um, so there is a continuous pattern of mutual collaboration between entrepreneur, official, and local aristocrats. That's also um, um, continued um, in the Indonesian period later on. Um, so it's a big business versus the wilderness. Sometimes uh, the locals too also um, uh, um, uh, go against the planters and go against the uh, the big business, the officials. But then most of the time, big business, of course, prevail. Um, so, but the directions of eruptions do matter, and if we see from the 19th century up to uh, to 1940, most of the areas that were devastated was in in the west. So, um, the, the 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 planters still keep on um, um, still still make an economic progress quite well in the south and the east. Um, then, settlement and agricultural policies do not strictly related to danger zone area. Then, this is also. Um, Intri in, intriguing, especially uh, well after um, we see uh, from 1822 um, eruptions that was um, very devastating. Um, it was not because of that eruption that um, the western part of Marapi uh, forbidden for the for the planters, but because of the, the of, of the Dutch wanted to keep it for himself for the for the for the cultivation system. So that would conclude my presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nabal. Okay, so uh, we have a few questions and comments in the um, chat. 